happened again just yesterday. I was returning home from work. I came up to this stop sign and the engine quit. I couldn't believe it. It was right in the middle of town, the busiest time of day. Luckily, it started right up again and I was able to continue on. But I don't mind telling you, it made me nervous. That's how the story usually starts. With a Buick owner who's concerned with the performance of their car. Today, we'll concentrate on solving some actual drivability problems and demonstrate a five-step approach for diagnosing drivability problems caused by engine electronics. The five steps for diagnosing drivability problems include reviewing the service history, performing a visual inspection, scanning the data stream, reviewing service bulletins, and using the CAMS diagnostics. The groundwork for this program was laid in previous drivability programs. Drivability Diagnosis Engine Mechanical and Drivability Diagnosis Reading the Data Stream. As a Buick District Service Manager, I see all kinds of problems, like the one presented in the opening of this program. I was originally told that the customer had experienced several drivability problems, from engine cuts out to engine won't start. However, before I get started, I always try to get the facts straight, if possible by reviewing the service history. That way I can tell exactly what has or has not been done. I guess you might call reviewing the service history the first step. Another good idea is to talk directly with the customer. It's surprising how much one can learn about the actual problem from the customer. In this case, it turned out the main complaint was the engine quit on deceleration. I believe the customer's exact words were, I came, I came up, up to, to the stop, stop sign and, and the, the engine, engine quit. quit. In any case, it is important to verify the complaint with a road test. If possible, by having the customer demonstrate the problem. It seemed like a simple problem. Step two is performing a visual inspection, or in other words, taking a good look under the hood. One of the first steps in diagnosing any drivability problem is a thorough underhood inspection. Previously, I did find a wire that had been rubbing against the power steering pump. This type of problem is common. The wire had not rubbed through, but it was a potential problem, so I rerouted it. Step three is to scan the data stream. I used the CAMS terminal. However, similar results can be obtained using a scan tool. Since I also contact dealerships not equipped with CAMS, a scan tool is handy. Detailed instructions for using both the CAMS dynamic display and a scan tool were provided in the program about reading the data stream. Start by checking for trouble codes. This time, no trouble codes were present. If trouble codes are present, refer to the trouble code charts in the Buick chassis service manual. While scanning the data with the key on and the engine off, I noticed that the TPS signal was high. The TPS signal on this vehicle should be a maximum of 0.44 volts. Since the ECM uses the throttle position sensor to control a number of outputs, a high TPS setting could cause a drivability problem. However, it is probably not the cause of this problem. It is possible that the incorrect TPS signal is the result of previous service. The minimum air rate might have been adjusted up to compensate for the problem and the TPS was not reset. The minimum air rate can be properly adjusted using the CAMS terminal. This procedure is accessed from the dynamic display by touching special tests. When the minimum air rate is selected, the terminal guides you through each step of the procedure. If a CAMS terminal is not available, adjust minimum air rate by first grounding the ALDL diagnostic terminal or using a scan tool to place the system in the field service mode. Then, with the ignition on, wait 30 seconds and disconnect the IAC electrical connector. Next, start the engine and allow it to enter closed loop operation. With the system in closed loop, place the gear selector in drive and observe engine speed. If engine speed is not within specification, adjust the minimum air rate by turning the idle stop screw. Remember, adjusting the minimum air rate affects the throttle position sensor. So don't forget to check the TPS voltage. Now, back to the customer's car. With the key on, the other data seemed fine. 
so I started the engine to check the data at idle. Another nice feature of the CAMS terminal is the idle data check. With this feature, the terminal does all the work for you. When the idle data check is selected, the CAMS terminal automatically checks all of the data at idle and highlights any data not within the acceptable range. I didn't actually need this feature this time. It was obvious that the IAC counts were extremely high. At that point, I had a pretty good idea about the cause of the problem, but I decided to try to recreate the condition anyway. The CAMS Vehicle Service Monitor, or VSM, is designed especially for this purpose. Like the dynamic display, instructions for using the VSM feature were provided in drivability diagnosis, reading the data stream. In most cases, though, the instructions on the CAMS terminal will walk you through each step. With the VSM recorder installed in the vehicle, I took the car out for a road test. I drove the car for a few miles and then tried a quick stop. The engine didn't quit, but I pressed the trigger anyway because I wanted to see what had happened. Eventually, the engine did quit as I came up to a stop. After that, it happened at almost each stop. After taking the maximum five recordings, I headed back to the shop to see what had been uncovered. I decided to closely monitor three signals, RPM, IAC, and vehicle speed. By watching vehicle speed, I could tell when the car had come to a stop. I also wanted to keep my eye on engine RPM and IAC counts so I could see what was happening when the problem occurred. The data for the first event seemed normal enough. As vehicle speed decreased, engine speed steadily decreased, leveling off about 600 RPM. IAC counts dropped to about 22 and remained there. The data for the event in which the engine quit was a different story. As the vehicle came to a stop, engine speed fell to 450 RPM, and IAC counts didn't fall below 35. That confirmed my early suspicions. The IAC valve was indeed lost. In other words, the actual IAC pinto position did not match the ECM command. So I removed the IAC and replaced it with a new one. Actually, I had a good idea from the beginning what could be causing the condition. Maybe you also read Buick Service Bulletin 86-6E19, which brings me to the fourth step of the diagnostic process. Be familiar with all the drivability-related service bulletins. That's where this reference manual comes in handy. It is an index of drivability-related bulletins. The bulletins are categorized by subject, and a brief summary of each is provided. After I had replaced the IAC, I also checked the throttle body for coking. I was pretty certain the IAC was causing the problem in this case, but I wanted to be sure the vehicle did not have the coking condition described in Service Bulletin 866E19. This condition is caused when oil residue from the PCV system accumulates inside the throttle body, limiting airflow past the throttle plate in the idle position. To diagnose for this condition, check the minimum air rate as we previously discussed. If it is less than specified, the throttle body should be removed to check for residue. One point to remember, what appears to be just a small amount of residue can be enough to limit airflow. Now that we've covered steps one through four, I should remind you that this diagnostic approach does not include every possible step. It's just a guide. Some basic things still have to be done, like verifying the repair with a road test. Now, let's look at another example. Although drivability problems can be solved without the aid of cams, this next example demonstrates the advantages of cams. Okay, Mr. Black, I'd like you to describe exactly what happens to your car. Well, it happens when I'm driving on the expressway. Mm -hmm. uh, the car begins to jerk and buck. Sure. Almost like it's running out of gas. Mm -hmm. Nothing extremely noticeable, but it is annoying. Oh, I can imagine. Does the engine ever stop? Well, the engine hasn't stopped yet, okay. but I'm afraid it might. Fix it, please. Just fix it. Well, in this case, the problem was unusually hard to diagnose. After completing the first four steps, I still hadn't discovered the cause of the owner's problem. 
Remembering that on a previous car, a similar condition was caused by an ignition system malfunction, I decided to check for ignition secondary voltage under load using a spark tester. The system checked OK. I also checked the crank sensor for chips, cracks, looseness, or other damage, and made sure the interrupter ring was not contacting the sensor. Then using gauge tool J36179, I checked the crank sensor gap. Everything seemed fine. Finally, I decided to try what I should have tried earlier, the CAMS diagnostics feature, which is our fifth step. Before continuing, let's talk about the CAMS diagnostic feature. It's designed to help you locate the source of performance problems through fault isolation and symptom analysis procedures. To use this feature, touch the Diagnostics box on the touch screen. The terminal will then display the vehicle setup instructions. With the ignition off, connect the terminal battery leads to the vehicle battery. Then connect the terminal ALDL lead to the vehicle ALDL connector. After completing the setup procedure, touch Done and turn the ignition on. The terminal then asks you to enter the vehicle identification number. The CAMS terminal stores the VINs from the last four vehicles diagnosed. You can select one from the list or touch New Vehicle and enter a new VIN. On the next screen, enter the odometer reading. The terminal then displays vehicle information, such as model year, vehicle type, and other specifications, and asks, are the above specifications correct? If they are, touch Yes. The terminal then performs a campaign search. Now you're ready to start testing. The first test is the ground credibility check. The ECM ground circuit is tested starting at the throttle position sensor harness and working back through the ECM to ground. Notice the top of the screen shows the ground circuit and the lower part of the screen provides the test instructions. To perform the test, turn the ignition off Disconnect the throttle position sensor harness and connect probe number four to the throttle position sensor harness. Probe number four is one of 42 probes used with the CAMS diagnostic feature. Each probe can be identified by its VPI number. The probes connect to one or more of the system components and are used to perform the fault isolation procedures. For example, probe number four can be connected to the AC pressure switch barometric pressure sensor, manifold absolute pressure sensor, oil pressure switch, and the throttle position sensor. The other end of the probe connects to the CAMS terminal probe lead. Some of the tests require the use of a breakout box. The breakout box is connected between the ECM and ECM harness to check the continuity of the harness wires. Now back to the ground credibility check. After connecting probe 4, touch the test box on the screen or press the test button on the terminal probe lead. If a fault is detected, the terminal will lead you through an analysis of the ground circuit. After the ground credibility test, the terminal instructs you to turn the ignition on and asks if the engine will start. If no is touched, the terminal will guide you through the ignition system diagnosis. If yes is touched, the terminal displays the drivability symptoms screen. This screen lists possible drivability symptoms. Select one or more of the symptoms, then touch enter. At this point, the terminal asks you if you want to run the system tests. If yes is touched, the terminal leads you through the ALDL test, part throttle test, and idle test. The ALDL test is first. To perform this test, make sure the ignition is on. Then follow the instructions on the screen. The test starts by checking the air conditioning input to the ECM. The instructions say to move the AC switch to the AC or defrost position. When the terminal receives the message that the AC has been energized, the green arrow moves to the off position, instructing you to turn the AC off. In a similar manner, the test checks the park neutral input to the ECM. The next part of the ALDL test checks the operation of the service engine soon or check engine light. The terminal causes the ECM to energize the light and the instructions on the screen ask you to verify that the light is on. 
The terminal then causes the ECM to flash the light on and off and asks you to verify that the light is flashing. The next system test is the part throttle test. The first message on the screen is, please start engine. After starting the engine, the terminal instructs you to accelerate the engine to 2500 RPM. A graph is then displayed showing the acceptable test range and actual engine speed. A blinking message appears when test conditions are not acceptable. Below the graph, the test instructions are shown. When test conditions are correct, a green box appears displaying the number of data streams being recorded. After 10 data streams are recorded, the terminal displays the message, please let engine idle, followed by the test results. Each test area is listed on the screen, followed by the results of that test. The next test is the idle test. Again, the terminal records 10 data streams and then displays the test results. After all of the system tests are completed, any faults detected during the test are displayed. The terminal evaluates the faults and recommends additional tests. These tests are referred to as fault isolation procedures or FIPS. The terminal prioritizes the fault isolation procedures and displays the first test on the screen. In this case, vacuum leaks. With the automatic sequences selected by answering yes, the terminal will guide you through the sequences automatically. If no is touched, the terminal provides a suggested test sequence menu that allows you to perform one or all of the tests in any order by entering the numbered box corresponding to the test. If 000 is entered, the dynamic display can be accessed. If 999 is entered, the terminal allows you to select alternate tests. The fault isolation procedure screens are similar to the ground credibility screen. On top, the circuit being tested is shown, followed by the test instructions. The IAC test instructions say to make sure the ignition is off and the ALDL is connected to the vehicle. Next, disconnect the IAC and check the connector end harness. The instructions then ask if the problem was found. If yes is touched, the terminal asks you to enter the results of your repair and the diagnostics procedure is terminated. If no is touched, the terminal continues diagnostics. Now, let's get back to the customer's car. As it turns out, I didn't get past the ground credibility test. The terminal detected a problem in the ground circuit. The problem was caused by an intermittent open condition in the ECM internal circuitry, so I had to replace the ECM. I'm sure by applying this five-step approach, reviewing the service history, performing a visual inspection, scanning the data stream, reviewing service bulletins, and using the CAMS diagnostics when necessary, you'll have just as much success when diagnosing electronic drivability problems. And that's how the story should always end, with satisfied Buick owners who are happy with the performance of their Buicks.